it's, it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Um, this is a student-run conference. This is the, the student organization is Hawkinson University Energy Association, and this is uh, their first uh, conference. This is their spring energy conference, and given the enthusiastic response, I think we're going to try and continue this conference. Um, and so this conference is appropriately named on New Jersey's energy future. Um, my name is Lynn Liu. I'm uh, a professor in the chemical and biological engineering department and the director of the Amherst Center. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Amherst Center and then, um, and then hand the podium over. So the mission of the Amherst Center is to develop solutions for our energy and environmental future. So we're really thrilled uh, to be able to host this conference uh, with PUEA. Um, a pillar of the mission that's also on display here today is, is really our engagement with practitioners um, outside the walls of Princeton University. And so you may know that we have a corporate affiliates program called Princeton e Affiliates Partnership. And this Princeton e Affiliates Partnership has three simple goals. It's A, to lower the barriers for collaboration with industry. Uh, B, it's to, uh, B, it's to, oh, we're privileged to have former Governor Florian join us today. Thank you for coming. Um, and, and, and B is to uh, 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 promote technology transfer, and then C is to facilitate teacher-student-practitioner interactions. And really, convening uh, the Princeton University community, policymakers, and key stakeholders at this venue really speaks to this third goal of bringing everybody together uh, for a discussion on energy policy today. Um, today's topic is timely and appropriate given uh, the passing of the New Jersey Energy Bill that was much debated upon, right? I mean, I think among other things, the three things that are really relevant today are the subsidies to enable nuclear power plants to continue running, uh, renewables, 50% of the energy mix uh, in 2030, as well as this offshore wind project. So um, with, you know, key stakeholders and, and, and policymakers and um, uh, our, our, our keynote and our panelists in the room, I hope they'll speak to uh, this energy policy uh, today. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker this morning, um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, PUEA, um, the students in PUEA, led <coughs> by Amber Lynn, who's back there. Amber, if you can get your student officer to ask her up. Um, they've worked tirelessly despite having a full load of courses and some doing junior independent work and senior thesis in pulling this conference together. So this was completely driven by them. Um, it's their vision. Um, they fundraised. They invited the speakers. Um, uh, they're responsible for bringing us together. I'd also like to acknowledge Judy Greenwald, who's sitting up here. Judy, um, if you want to... So we just uh, launched this um, Visiting Fellows Program at the Amherst Center, and the purpose of this Visiting Fellows Program is to bring practitioners to our community so we can interact with them. And so Judy is one of two inaugural uh, Gearhart Amherst Visiting Fellow at the Amherst Center, and in the 10 weeks that she's been with us, she's been a force to be reckoned with, I think, <laughs> and she's really helped the student organization to bring this meeting together. And then from the Amherst Center team, I'd like to acknowledge Maura Salinka, who's standing back there, as well as Jeff Fitz, who I don't know where he is. Um, um, but they've sweated over the details, the logistical details for this meeting. So thank you very much. <laughs> so now let me uh, introduce uh, a good friend of the Amherst Center and our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Ralph Fizzo, who's the president, uh, CEO, and chairman of uh, Public Service Enterprise Group, or PSCG. Uh, Ralph received all his degrees in mechanical engineering uh, from Columbia University, and then spent time as a research scientist at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, uh, doing numerical simulations on fusion energy experiments. Um, you can read about Ralph's bio and his many accomplishments, but I thought I would keep my remarks um, focused on my interactions with Ralph. So I remember distinctly the first time I met Ralph. This was. Um, when the Amherst Center um, was first founded and we were thinking about uh, putting together a corporate affiliates program. And really, Ralph um, really gave us uh, generously his time and advice in how to structure such a corporate affiliates program. 
And PSCG uh, was the first member of this corporate affiliates program and remains an active member of this corporate affiliates program. And now Ralph is on our advisory council, and, um, and in that capacity, he's helped me think about private academic partnerships, and as you can imagine, there are challenges associated with that. Um, so it's, it's been great having, having, um, having you as a friend and, and, and uh, having you give us advice and feedback on how we're doing. Um, so I've seen Ralph give numerous talks on campus, and I've come to know him as an inspirational leader and a leader with a big, big heart. So um, with that, Ralph, the stage is yours. Uh, generous, generous introduction. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Amber, for the invitation. Thank you for pulling this all together. And it's great to see familiar faces, Governor Florio, Jimmy Fox, Commissioner Hoskins, and uh, far too many names for me to uh, try to go through right now. So, my presentation was designed around New Jersey's energy future, and when Amber first asked me to give this presentation, I had no idea that uh, yesterday would be a day of significant policy decisions, or at least proposed policy decisions in New Jersey, one should not uh, deny the governor uh, his right to decide whether or not what was done makes sense for New Jersey. So I will intersperse the comments about what occurred yesterday in the first presentation, but still kind of stick with my main message. So we have the first slide. So, PSCG is a 115-year-old company, so I hired Arithmetic in 2003, we were celebrating our 100th anniversary. And at that time, people were digging through the archives. And they found this picture, and they also found a purchase order, which I have not committed to memory, so I will read to you uh, exactly what it said. It, it read the, the following, uh, item to purchase, colon, a truck. And then reason to purchase, colon, the horse died. <laughs> they got the truck. This group of people, actually, I would bet dollars to donuts, laid pipe that we are still using today. So while change is something that has completely dominated the transportation sector and the communication sector, there's been some varying degrees of change that we've experienced in the energy sector that Perhaps it's about time we do a little bit, a bit more passion and conviction. And then there are some areas that have not undergone change that are probably doing just fine. So let me just paint this a picture for you of the future we'd like to see nationwide uh, and starting here in New Jersey. It has three characteristics. Characteristic number one is that people use less energy. As a matter of fact, as little as they need. Characteristic number two, whatever they use is cleaner than it's ever been before, with a particular emphasis on zero or low carbon. And characteristic number three, that whatever they use is delivered with a degree of reliability and resiliency that's been unmatched in the past. So just to make sure everyone's awake, we're going to do a little quiz uh, in the beginning of this presentation. And it, tests your honesty more than your knowledge. <laughs> so, by a show of hands, how many of you woke up this morning and said, I can't wait to use a kilowatt hour? <laughs> I, I, the, the, the video person was scratching his head, but the design person in the room. Okay, now, I check our stock price about every millisecond. And I did not wake up this morning saying, I can't wait to use a kilowatt hour. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, when can I, I can't wait to use the law, or be seated. I don't want to be unkind to our, our guest colleagues. But I am in the middle of a lecture series that I am looking forward to watching tonight on my television set. And maybe some of you are looking forward to watching an NHL hockey game tonight. Maybe others are just looking forward to having some friends over for a get-together, and you want to make sure that the temperature in the house is comfortable. Or there's a zillion other things that everyone in this room is looking forward to that is enabled by electricity and natural gas. And I would bet, again, I bet twice in the past 10 minutes, I'm not a betting person typically, that every one of us would be more than happy to have a pleasant experience doing whatever it is we seek to do tonight, if we could do it by using less energy. And the answer to that is that we can, and it's all about energy efficiency. And there is such low-hanging fruit in the arena of energy efficiency that it boggles the mind as to why we don't do more of it. 
So a couple of years ago, I went out on a mission to talk to some customers. Did you want me to have the next slide? Because in New Jersey, we do a pretty bad job of energy efficiency. We, we do a great job of setting targets for renewables. But I think in the last complete year of data that I've seen, which would be data for 2016, we were 30th, we were 25th in the nation in energy efficiency. And in fact, if you looked at our incremental efficiency gains in calendar year 17, we were 30th. So we're probably going to go down in that ranking. And when I thought about, well, why is that the case? And why are some other states so much better? Something does jump out. That we do not have incentives in New Jersey for the primary participant who has made energy efficiency successful in other states. And I know this is parochial on my part, perhaps also. And that is the utility. New Jersey continues to rely upon the customer to be the primary investor in energy efficiency. Now, there are some customers who are very, very good at that. They happen to be our large industrial users, our energy intensive businesses. They are sophisticated, smart energy consumers, and they do a good job of managing their energy bill for economic reasons. But many others do not. So I went out and started talking to some of our larger customers that I thought should do a better job. And with apologies for those of you who have heard me give, tell the story, because this occurred several years ago. One of the customers I went out to see was a large hospital that is in our service territory. And I just explained to them, I said, you do this in 12 years, and 8 years, and 14 years, depending on what this is, you will make your money back and lower your operating costs. And, and he politely listened to what I had to say, and I was hopefully politely explaining to him what a bad decision maker he was. And then he described to me the following scenario. He said, well, if you have two children, I said, of course, it is. I hope they're healthy and all as well. I said, yes, they are. Thank you. So, suppose something happens to them. I'm not wishing this on you, but they needed a medical procedure. Are you going to research your decision on where they should get their medical procedure on the basis of the BTUs per square foot that the hospital consumes? Or are you going to make your decision based upon the quality of the medical care? Sorry about that. The doctor, the... the uh, the, the, the equipment that's available in that facility. And I said, of course, it's the latter. He said, so if I have $5 million of discretionary capital, it is not going to replace my boiler plant that my engineers tell me have another 10 or 15 years of inefficient life ahead of them. It is going to go to the medical equipment, the diagnostic equipment that will allow me to recruit the finest in the medical profession that I can recruit. And had similar conversations with other institutions, actually higher education. And uh, the answer was the same. Lab space, faculty members, seed money for research for junior faculty. That's where disposable discretionary income will go. And the list went on and on and on. Uh, uh, landowners who, who had commercial office space or, or building owners who had multifamily space. It would be in the things that attract uh, their core business. And in fact, as I thought about the responses I was getting, I realized that all I needed to do to get these responses was to look in the mirror. Quiz question number two. If we build a power plant, we'll talk about a few power plants we're building in a moment, what is the expected duration of the payback period? So we build the plant, and how many years later do we expect to break even on a discounted cash flow basis? Any guesses? 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Good guess. You've heard me give the speech before. <laughs> it's, it's about year 26 to 28. Okay. Most people guess five years. Now, so we run a 40 year discounted cash flow model. After month 18, we're making numbers up. We are. <laughs> we know what's going to happen after month 18. Now, if my human resources vice president comes and senior vice president says, I have a new timesheet application that I think will save us money, what is the expected payback period that we close it? Yeah, it's three to five years. So in economic terms, there's a difference between core investment and non-core investment, and all of us applies a very, very different return expectation for non-core investments. Who is the investor when it comes to energy efficiency in New Jersey? They have another name. The customer. It's the customer. And the customer's not viewing energy consumption, with the exception of the energy intensive businesses I mentioned before as a core investment. So their discount rate 
is a perfectly rational decision, but it's one that gets reflected in market flaws that result from the underinvestment in energy efficiency in New Jersey achieving this ranking. Now, some states do a lot better than the one half of 1%, with less of that will be achieved. Next slide. If you take a look at some other states, like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, they actually save up to 3% of their energy. So if we could just achieve two-thirds of what they achieve, let's not even try to do better than that. Here's what it would mean. And literally putting $150 million back in the pockets of New Jersey. Yes. Reducing carbon by a million tons a year. Now the model that other states have successfully deployed, I think 28 or 29 states, if I'm not mistaken, is decoupling. And the premise behind decoupling is very simple. A customer's bill has two components. There's a fixed cost component, and there's a variable cost component. <coughs> there are energy efficiency measures that can be taken that are less expensive than the variable cost component. So if a customer compensates the utility who becomes the investor for the fixed cost plus the energy efficiency investment, they are still paying less than they would if they were incurring a variable cost component. So you get what I call the triple win. The environment wins because one less kilowatt hour, one less DTU is consumed. The customer wins because the payment of the fixed and the energy efficiency investment is less than the prior full bill. And the shareholder wins because they're not foregoing their fixed costs and presumably an incentive is created for them to invest in the energy efficiency investment. That triple win is something that we need to begin to take advantage of in New Jersey. And in fact, you will see in the coming couple of months, New Jersey making, and PSEG making a significant, significant proposal to invest in energy efficiency in this state. Part of the legislation that was passed yesterday, which is great news, uh, and, and it was inspired by Governor Murphy, who I tip my hat to for his passion for these issues, was to ask the VP, require the VP to set energy efficiency standards and to allow the VPU to, uh, to, to put into place a decoupling in, uh, environment where the utilities can be incentivized to participate in energy efficiency. So this is exciting news to me and is by far the number one thing we ought to be working on uh, for customers. So if we get people to use less energy through this type of uh, approach, then the question is, how do we get them to use, to, to, how do we supply them with cleaner energy? Next slide. So, uh, one of the things, of course, is to invest heavily in renewables. Now, PSEG last year was named by some organization, and I'm blanking on it for the moment, the number one utility in the nation for investing in solar energy. I think they're called Smart Energy Power Associations. SIPA is the acronym, but I forget what it stands for. used to stand for Solar Energy Producer Association. And we have spent close to $2 billion in solar. Most of that is not in New Jersey. We, we do it in two ways. We do it both as a regulated entity in New Jersey and as an unregulated entity outside of New Jersey. In 1978, for some of you, that uh, was during the, the Cro-Magnon period. But for me, it was when I was getting my bachelor's degree. My senior thesis was on solar-powered air conditioning. And I was genuinely excited about the fact that it was five years away from commercial feasibility. <laughs> uh, a couple of years later, I was convinced that I should pursue a PhD in fusion because that was only 10 years away. From <laughs> Just goes to show you, if you ever ask me what is within the horizon for commercial feasibility, you should short that stock because I'm not very good at predicting it. But nonetheless, uh, solar I think has great promise. And for, for land-based systems, it's really the only viable technology for us here in New Jersey. Uh, a quiz question uh, number three. Uh, so, so solar tends to be rather expensive. Uh, so uh, Dr. Karan in, in the, uh, the audience, and uh, we, we partnered with then Petrosolar for these pole top systems, which uh, was due to their fabulous technology on making the inverters far less expensive than they had in the past. And uh, uh, we had these panels all around the surface territory. I was worried that you know, when we first did this, that uh, strong winds uh, could be an issue. I'm kind of happy to say that strong winds were never an issue with these panels. Uh, but the reason why I know that is that during Superstorm Sandy, quite a few of our poles were down and the panels were still attached. So I'm not so sure that, that uh, the weakest link was paid attention to in those days. But there are some issues around solar that we cannot ignore. As a huge advocate and champion for solar, 
I beg people to not continue to pretend that solar energy is free. So, so there was, there's a, a headline article in the newspaper today, and my, my not so favorite newspaper anymore, that has as its headline, uh, I think it's something to the $300 million PSEG bailout passes or something like that. So I read the article. I did not have a blood pressure cuff on at the time. <laughs> and and it, it talked about $300 million. We'll talk about $300 million eventually, I'm sure. And I know the next panel will. But throughout the article, it then talked a little bit about the exciting, and I mean that with all sincerity, the exciting 50% target we set for renewables in the year 2030. Not one mention of the cost. Not one mention of the cost. That's a problem. That is a serious problem. About two months ago, there was, uh, I guess it was more than that, so maybe it was in December, the New York Times had an article, an extensive article, about the threat that tax reform was posing federal tax reform. So solar and other renewable energy credits, tax credits, and if you read the article that I did, it was not until you got to the last paragraph that this green energy, this renewable energy, this clean energy, and these credits that were at risk in the article used the S word, the last paragraph of subsidy. The very next day, not, not the New York Times, so maybe it's different writers, uh, headline was, Nuclear Bailout Bill Stalls in Legislature. Okay, so with that as a back, and by the way, none of these articles had any misstatements in them. None of them said anything that was incorrect. We canvass our customers on a regular basis about how do we do if you called us, how do we do if you lost power, how do we do under a thousand one scenarios. And we always ask an open-ended question at the end of that, and I know, I know many of you have heard me give this place, so please don't, don't, don't shut out the answer if you don't. We always say, other than lower your rates, what is the single most important thing PSCG can do for you? So other than lower your rates, what's the single most important thing PSCG can do for you? What was the answer? Reliability. Reliability would be a good answer. It's not, believe it or not, it's the third most popular. Yeah. Reduce carbon footprint. Reduce carbon footprint is not the number one answer. It's the second most popular. So the second most popular answer is invest more heavily in renewables. Actually, the number one answer to so other than lower your rates, what's the most important thing we can do for you is lower my rates. <laughs> it really is. And by the way, Princeton is our service director, so reading comprehension or arithmetic is a challenge for some of the students. So we probe. Right? So, so if people are so concerned about lowering the rates, and let's assume that it's not a reading comprehension issue, then how can the number two answer be invested in renewables when that is not going to lower rates? In New Jersey, today, with technology, we should be spending less money on inefficient technology and more on research to make that inefficient technology more efficient. I said that once at the United Nations program that I needed an armed guard to protect the kids I left for me. We thought we would spend more money on research and less on actually stolen equipment. So we asked our because okay, well, how much are you willing to spend on a renewable energy? About 95% of our customers are not willing to spend more than $5 per month on their own use of renewable energy. How much are customers spending today per month on their neighbor's use of renewable energy in New Jersey? I'm talking about residential customers. But the store is much worse for industrial and commercial customers. How much are they spending today? Dale's pointing to their neighbor. <laughs> if they won't spend more than five on their own, what, what are they spending today on their neighbors? Six. Six dollars a month. What does the legislation that was enacted yesterday put as a cap for what we would be willing to spend on our neighbors when we're willing? Seven. It's a closer to nine. Nine and right. seven. Right, that's right, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. It goes down to seven, you're right. <laughs> now, why, why? Right, so these are the same customers who say that other than lower my rates, slow my rates. Now, I won't spend more than five on myself, but I'm willing to spend six today, going to nine, and down to seven. Why are they willing to do that? We don't tell them. They don't know. It's not in their bill. It wasn't in that article today. <coughs> do we really think that this is such a shady thing to do that we can't be honest with? I am proud of the fact that New Jersey has these targets. 
I think we should tell customers it's worth it. What is six dollars a month? I think it's two iTunes downloads or something like that. There are customers who can't pay that, and we need to help them. But let's not pretend that it's not costing money. So there are other things we can do to clean up energy, other more important things. Next slide, Jim. And we've started doing some of that. We've retired our two remaining coal plants in New Jersey. Uh, we spent a billion dollars on back-end technology improvements on those in terms of mercury, SO2, fine particulates. Uh, but I, I, I won't mislead you. The reason why we shut them down was not because they didn't want to the it was because of the cost of natural gas. We will be retiring our one remaining coal plant in Connecticut in calendar year 2021. That will leave us with a 25% share of a coal plant that is operated by NRG, actually a subsidiary of NRG called Genelon in Pennsylvania. Uh, or actually, we, we, no, I forget the chain. It's, it's NRG, Genelon, Reba, or some such thing. But, uh, but we'll be a 25% owner of that coal plant in Pennsylvania. And uh, that will be it for us with coal. We're, we're, we're not putting any new money in coal. We're out of the coal business, per se. Uh, and, and we are building, we do believe that natural gas is an important and valuable contributor to replacing retiring coal uh, as we use nuclear and natural gas as a bridge to an all renewable future. So we're building three natural gas plants, one in Connecticut, one in Maryland, here in New Jersey. As many of you know, natural gas produces about half of the carbon dioxide of coal. None of the fine particulates, none of the SO2, none of the mercury, but that is a big NOx emitter and is a big contributor to ozone. So it's not something that we want to learn a part of our future. Uh, in 2008, we were spending about 10 to 12 dollars an MMBTU for natural gas. That's the primary cost of running your natural gas power plant. And any guesses as to what we spent each of the last two Octobers for natural gas versus that 10 to 12 dollars for MMBTU? I see some of the folks from my trading organization that will correct me if I'm wrong. Four dollars? No. Lower. One dollar lower. Wow. Yeah. I think we're paying between thirty and fifty cents. Now I'm, I'm being a little bit sneaky here. I picked October. Both the last two Octobers we had a couple of seventy degree days when the demand was as high. But during the course of the winter, we're typically paying about two dollars per MBT for natural winter time. That's unheard. This is a tremendous consumer dividend, one that we cannot ignore. And uh, I, I think that's something that really is benefiting uh, many, many of our customers. That's really good. But so one of the questions, what is our low carbon future? The next slide. Here. And as you can see today in the United States, uh, the vast majority of it remains nuclear. In New Jersey, 90% of it is nuclear. That 10% is a combination of solar and, and, uh, uh, and wind. Last year, I think about 10% of our electricity came from renewables in New Jersey. If I don't include landfill gas, and I don't include hydro, we don't have much hydro. Uh, the vast majority, I think 7% or 8%, maybe up by 1% or 2%, came from out-of-state wind, which costs about $100 million in class one renewable energy credits. And then the remaining 3% came from solar. Any guesses as to how much the renewable energy credits and solar cost in New Jersey this year? Ridiculous amount. No, it's close to 500 million. Yeah, Dale's right. A ridiculous amount, 500 million. Those are synonyms. Uh, any guesses what it was two years ago? Also ridiculous. Also ridiculous. It was the same ridiculous amount, 500 million. Our, our renewable energy system is, is, is a disaster in New Jersey. And, and again, I give credit to Governor Murphy for recognizing this and advocating that the EPU uh, put an end to this uh, program in the next two years. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to participating in that discussion so we can continue to invest in solar and in wind, uh, but, but, but lower that impact on the, on the customer. So, so nuclear is a critical part of, of uh, New Jersey's carbon-free energy mix, uh, not to mention it's a critical part of its, uh, of its ability to provide uh, electricity at all without depending upon a single fuel. I am not at all pretend that nuclear does not have a high level of waste disposal problem. Okay, so that is a, a significant issue. There are engineering solutions. The biggest impediments are political. They happen to be in Washington, D.C. There are other big political issues in Washington, D.C. nowadays, perhaps, that uh, should not open that Pandora's box. And I'm just leave it at that. So from our point of view as a company, we, we emphasize energy efficiency to reduce as much as possible what people need. We invest in natural gas and existing nuclear as a bridge to an increasing renewable future. And now the question is, okay, so we've got this cleaner supply stack and it's as little as we need. 
How do we make sure it's delivered as reliably as possible? So next slide. We've had some rough experiences in the past few years. These are some pictures of Superstorm Sandy. And uh, you know, the customer's demand for electricity is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Uh, by that, I mean the following. If I think about things that I've grown increasingly dependent upon, it's typically because I use more and more of it. That's not the case in electricity, right? If you are the world's worst consumer, and you go out and replace your air conditioning system with your refrigerator, you are going to buy something that is far more efficient than what you used 15 years ago. Even though you're connecting a lot more mobile devices and various other pieces of equipment in your household, that large energy consuming device outweighs the increase in energy resulting from, from, from recharging of your phone. So what we have is a society that's increasingly dependent upon electronic devices, but because the large energy consuming devices are so much more efficient, they use less of it. So that's a problem for the way in which companies are regulated, say, because we're regulated primarily on a volumetric basis, right? So the numerator is how much we invest to achieve certain outcomes, and the denominator is how much a customer uses. And we've trained our regulators to worry about the rate that we charge customers. Well, if the denominator is getting smaller, or not growing, and the numerator is getting bigger, well, that rate is going to increase. And we have to change the discussion from one around rates to one around bills. Because I would bet that most of us know what we paid our utility last month when we wrote out the check, but we don't know what the rate was. We just know what the bill was. And resiliency is something that customers demand. Resiliency is a is a word that the industry has embraced to talk not about the fact that the light should stay on in a day like today, or even that they should stay on in a day where we have a normal rainstorm or a normal snow event, but they should stay on after a major event like Superstorm Sandy. And then just to give you an example of that, uh, and I, I, my communications team keeps coming up and telling me, Ralph, stop living in the past, that was six years ago, but hopefully the story just helps. When Superstorm Sandy hit, I remember being in our control room, we, we, uh, you know, oil models were saying that this could be a big event, it could be a big event. And it was about 6 p.m. And uh, Ralph LaRosa, who was the president of the utility at the time, and we do have a succession plan with PSCG that unless you named Ralph, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> He and I were sitting there, and uh, there was one model called the European Weather Model that predicted this sharp westerly jog right somewhere along New Jersey that was going to devastate us. Most of the other models had to kind of go north and smashing into New York or Connecticut. And about 6 p.m. Ralph and I looked at just the we dogs and another bullet. This isn't going to affect us. A half an hour later, we had lost 90% of our customers. And the European model was spot on. This thing just made a sharp left at Tom's River and cut across the middle of our service territory. And with the counterclockwise winds, basically took all of the tidal waters that existed and pushed them into northern New Jersey and flooded all of our low-lying infrastructure. It was a disaster, to say the least. Now, I, I literally <coughs> went along with a couple of uh, largely affected CEOs with President Obama and that, that evening or the next morning, I forget exactly when. It was a, he was concerned about uh, getting lights back on in cities and high, candidly high crime areas. He was worried about the petrochemical industry in New Jersey and access to uh, for the refineries to, to get back on power, ask questions about hospitals and things like that. He'll never remember the conversation. I don't often talk to presidents, so I remember the conversation. Mm -hmm. Two days later, he came to New Jersey. Somebody from the staff called on Air Force One to say, where do we stand in terms of restoration? Every day for the next two weeks, I was on the phone with Ernie Moniz at first, and then uh, Under Secretary Pomerantz. Ralph LaRose was on the phone with Governor Christie, who demonstrated outstanding leadership during Sandy. So it was a big deal. I mean, literally, the conversation's nonstop. I'll never forget, three days later, we were sitting in the Sloan Response Center. Our employees were just heroic, and many of them didn't have power, and yet they were sleeping in the office, uh, as, as did Ralph and I the first two days only. And then Ralph gets a, his phone rings, and he notices it's a call from a hospital. So he answers it, and uh, it turns out to be a doctor who somehow got his his cell phone information and said, look, I, I've heard in the newspapers, you are trying to restore critical circuits, and I have several elective heart surgeries today, and I want to know if I should do it on backup supply, because I'm a little nervous about that, or will you be able to get that power back? And Ralph and me, we got on it, and we got that power back. We never heard that from the doctor, but nonetheless, that, you, you literally begin to realize that people's lives are at stake here. So the President of the United States, this is, you know, 
a surging point. About two weeks later, and every day we're announcing a 10% restored, 20% restored, 90% restored. I get this incredibly articulate email from a customer. It goes on and on and on about how, how people are working so hard. She sees them out in the streets. She knows that they're sacrificing for their families. But if her power is not back on oh. that day, <laughs> her teenager is coming to live with me. <laughs> so, now I tell that story because some of us have had to deal with that. The reality is, for that customer, it wasn't a joke. I mean, she was, that was it. You know, two weeks was far too long. So, and, and, and for that cardiologist, uh, that heart search I'm seeing in terms of prolonged hemorrhages. So next slide. We've done some things about this. Uh, th through the Board of Public Utilities, we, we did seek and receive approval to invest heavily in the infrastructure. We put about $1.2 billion to work in effect in improving some of the facilities that were affected by Superstorm Sandy, and some of you may have a number of them just prior to that. Uh, we have Storm Cold Hurricane Irene. So we, we said, look, we know these facilities are low lying areas, we have to do something about it. We estimate that we need 3.5 billion to do it over 10 years, and the BP granted us 1.2 billion uh, over three years, which it was the same run rate, but not the whole program. So we will be going back to the board of public utilities in the coming few weeks to say we finished that. In fact, we finished the 1.2 billion dollar program $200 million uh, less expensive than we thought it would take. And, and that's been a great partnership. The board has been monitoring our performance, and, um, and I think they've accused of what we've done. In addition to that, there's other parts of the infrastructure that demand our attention, and we are replacing some of those little gas pipes that that horse and buggy laid down. Tremendous methane leakage. Great, great cooperation with the Environmental Defense Fund. Actually, they are still call it the Environmental Defense Fund, they just called EDF. Yeah, because of the methane that comes out of those pipes, uh, and as you know, methane is a 30x uh, contributor to, to the greenhouse effect versus carbon dioxide. And and with the significant investment in, in wind, which does not really exist onshore in New Jersey, uh, but does exist in other parts of PGM, where we've been investing more heavily on transmission, candidly, that wasn't to enable wind, that was more to de-bottleneck uh, some of the east-west flows that existed in that uh, system uh, from a reliability point of view. So last year was our peak investment level. I think we spent $3 billion across each of these three areas to make the system uh, more resilient. Next slide. So, so as we think about this future, which is one in which the customer uses less, it's cleaner, and it's more resilient, we do need to tackle this issue of not being rate focused, but being bill focused. And, and it, it, the joke here, of course, is that Nobody who makes candles were enthusiastic about incentivizing people to use light bulbs. And I like to joke about the fact that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. I mean, we need to think about doing things differently and, and people behave depending on how you incentivize them. Right now, utilities are incentivized to uh, sell more electricity and natural gas. That's how we get paid. And we have made a decision as a company that we are willing to cannibalize our power plants. And we are more than happy to help the customer use less energy. Uh, but we are not, we don't think it's smart to cannibalize our distribution system. But we do think the grid is going to be an essential part of our energy future, whether it's because people have a bunch of distributed generation or because the normal central station needs to be delivered through the grid. Uh, we're not smart enough to predict. Uh, but the, this type of decoupling mechanism I mentioned earlier, I think, can go a long way to helping us create the right incentive structure for this future of less energy, cleaner energy, and more reliable energy. Next slide. So, uh, on the nuclear bill uh, yesterday, uh, uh, we absolutely believe that what the legislature did was in the best interest of New Jerseyans. Uh, we have seen three studies, one candidly we paid for, one that the Nuclear Energy Institute paid for, okay, so two biased studies, obviously, uh, fairly, <laughs> fairly accused of that. One that was not made public by uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, that showed clearly that in the first five, each of the first five years, and again, 